Okay, we're going into the questions that I handed out, and they're questions about the kingdom of God. Of course, these studies are designed to help us, obviously, to uh, examine our own understanding of these, idea, uh, these uh, topics, make sure we understand them. Sometimes there's a little bit of a question that might throw a curve in there now and then, make us think a little deeply, uh, and sometimes it's just very poorly worded, and I pretend that it was a trick question or something. <laughs> So why don't we begin with the eight questions we have uh, for today. That'll be on the first portion, and we'll tie in a theme related to the kingdom of God for the second split here this afternoon after the announcements. So the first question is very basic. What is the, what is the kingdom of God? Nothing too complex about this. Uh, I guess the best way to define that or explain that, it would be a kingdom in which God is ruling. Therefore, it's a kingdom of God. It's where beings are subject to him. Now, we have kingdoms in the world. We have Gentile kingdoms down through history that we find in Bible prophecy. Those are the kingdoms of men. The kingdom of God would be a kingdom in which God is ruling. Which brings us right into question number two. Is there a kingdom of God today? Well, Matthew chapter 23, verse 22 is there a kingdom of God today? Matthew 23, 22, breaking in on the thought here, Jesus speaking, and he that shall swear by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him that sits thereon. So it speaks of God sitting on a throne. Well, if he's sitting on a throne, then he's ruling a kingdom. There must be subjects for him to rule. Now that's now, today. God sits on his throne. He's in, in the uh, process of ruling, ruling over, of course, the entire universe and the spirit beings that are in that kingdom. He's not sitting on a throne just to pa uh, pose for pictures, or as they do today, taking a selfie. No, he's on a throne ruling. So there is a kingdom of God today. Daniel 6, verse 26. Daniel 6, 26. Here the king is making a decree. He's learned a few things. Daniel 6, 26, I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, that's a kingdom of men, in every, uh, in every dominion of my kingdom, men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. Now they still held, had their gods. When he recognized the God of Daniel, it didn't mean he did away with all other gods. No, they all had their own and their different nations, but he's taking special note of the, the God of Daniel. For he's the living God. Now, he does think that he's a, a notch above all the other ones. He's a living God and steadfast forever, and his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall be ever, even unto the end. His kingdom. Yes, God has a kingdom. God's sitting on a throne. He's ruling that kingdom. It's here, it's today. Now there is a kingdom of God. Daniel 7, verse 10. Little description of that. It says, a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands, thousand thousands ministered unto him and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. Judgment was set. The books were open. Again, the throne of God. God sitting on a throne, ruling his kingdom, the kingdom of God. And finally, Matthew chapter 28, just to tie into this, this is a very dynamic kingdom. There's a great deal of activity taking place in this spiritual kingdom today. No one's just sitting around and, well, I wonder when Christ will return. There's a lot of activity taking place with these powerful angelic beings. God is ruling on his throne. But we find another dimension here. There's dynamic activity in that kingdom. Matthew 28, 18, And Jesus came and spoke unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. I've been given all power under God that sits on the throne. So Christ is at his right hand, and God the Father says, I've put everything under your hands. Everything's under your authority. Jesus told him, all power is given unto me. 
in heaven and in earth. So Jesus is overseeing the work of the angelic beings in fulfilling God's plan. They have a role and a function. Jesus is overseeing all of that under the Father, who's on his um, left. <clears throat> and he's, of course, overseeing the work of the church. So Christ is very active. The whole kingdom is active. Point number three is the millennium, the kingdom of God. Well, now it begins to get, let's say, maybe a little bit confusing when we use these terms. Is the millennium the kingdom of God? Look at 1 Corinthians 15, 50. Say you're an individual, a human being living in the millennium. Are you in the kingdom of God? 1 Corinthians 15, 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Flesh and blood can't get into the kingdom of God. If you're flesh and blood, you're not in the kingdom. Neither does corruption inherit incorruption. So the spiritual kingdom of God, which is the ultimate goal of all of us, to be changed to spirit and be ushered into the kingdom of God, Flesh and blood cannot enter in there, uh, therein. So the spiritual kingdom of God, the resurrected saints that are changed to spirit, of course, God the Father, Jesus Christ, are ruling over the physical nations during the time we call the millennium, the 1,000-year reign of Christ. Look at Luke 19, 11. This is where it gets a little bit confusing. And sometimes you have to understand what the context is. <clears throat> Technically, the kingdom of God is Christ and the resurrected saints. That kingdom is ruling over the nations, the physical nations, during the millennium. So technically, the millennium is not the kingdom of God. It's being ruled by the kingdom of God. But then here in Luke 19, 11, <clears throat> excuse me, as I heard these sayings, he added and spoke a parable because he was nigh to Jerusalem and because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. So they're speaking, of course, about Christ's kingdom. Here it's called the kingdom of God. Mark 9, 11. Mark 9, 11. <clears throat> He said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that there be some of them that stand here which shall not taste of death till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. That's a visible appearance of Christ's kingdom. So in a sense, we often speak about Christ's kingdom and refer to it as the kingdom of God. That's not necessarily bad or, or, or incorrect. <clears throat> Christ is uh, ruling during the millennium as the uh, kingdom of God because it's established by God, not by men. So it is God's kingdom and a godly kingdom. But there's the spirit, the, the real kingdom of God is composed of spirit beings. And that kingdom rules during the millennium. So often we call that the kingdom of God as well. Not necessarily incorrect, <clears throat> but there's a slight, slight difference in what we're speaking of because of what, what I read earlier. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So technically those living during the millennium are not in the kingdom of God, but Sometimes it's used interchangeably. <clears throat> okay, who rules the kingdom of God today? Let's read Revelation chapter 4, verse 8. Remember we said there is a kingdom now, today. God sits on his throne, ruling over the angelic beings. He's placed all things under Christ, who sits on his right hand. But the overall ruler is clear here from Revelation chapter 4, speaking of 
God the Father on his throne. Uh, verse 8. And the four beasts around the throne of God had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of the eyes within. And they rest not day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Well, that, that's the Father. We know chapter 4 is referring to the Father on his throne. So here's these beings. It says that they rest not day or night. I don't even know if you'd say they have day and night in that spirit realm. They don't really need it. It means they're continuously doing this. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who lives forever and ever, 24 elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you have created all things and for your pleasure they are and were created. Who, who rules the kingdom of God today? Well, God the Father is sitting on the throne, Christ at his right hand, all things placed under him. But he would be considered the primary ruler of the kingdom of God today. Okay, who will rule the kingdom of God during the millennium? Well, God the Father. Well, let's look at Revelation chapter 11. Let's see what that says. Revelation chapter 11. <clears throat> And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven. Revelation 11, 15. The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord, the Father, and of his, of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. So God the Father and Christ, specifically or technically, are ruling they have authority over that kingdom. The 24 elders, uh, the 24 elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the same one as chapter 4, which are and was and are to come, because you've taken to you your great power and reigned. Now, we know that Christ is going to be on the earth. God the Father does not return to the earth. But according to these verses, he also is considered ruling. They're under his authority as well. He's not, in other words, he's not out of the picture. Look at Daniel 7, verse 21. Some of this I covered on the Feast of Trumpets uh, last year. Daniel chapter 7. I'm not saying anything different than we've ever said. I'm just pointing out that we don't ever want to brush the Father completely aside. He's actively on his throne, ruling the universe, and gives the, the earth to Christ to administer. But they're both, in a sense, ruling, as we've read. It says, you are come because you've taken power and have reigned. Then in Daniel chapter 7, verse 21... I beheld, and the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them until the Ancient of Days came. The Ancient of Days is the Father. That's clear from, from the chapter and what he turns over to Christ. But here it says it prevailed again until the Ancient of Days, the Father, came. And judgment was given to the saints of the Most High, and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. It almost sounds like God the Father came when the government is given over to the saints at the start of the millennium. That can be a little confusing, but it's really not confusing. It's very harmonious with what we found in Revelation and, and what is actually taking place. Now, the article in the Life, Hope, and Truth uh, website entitled Ancient of Days, explains this. 
It says in that article, the article was on the subject of the ancient of days, which is God, the Father. And here's what it says in kind of a clar clarification of this. Some have assumed that the ancient of days in this passage, that's Daniel 7, 9, some have assumed it must be a reference to Jesus Christ instead of God the Father, since Jesus is prophesied to return to the earth to establish the kingdom of God, uh, establish the kingdom of God. Well, we know it's Christ who returns, that's clear. And if it says here, the ancient of days came and judgment was given to the saints, the ancient of days must be Jesus. But it's explaining, well, no, that's not the case. <clears throat> He will again come to earth as the authorized representative of God the Father. Christ comes to earth. Just like he's on his right hand, Jesus said, all authority has been given to me, all things placed under my feet. So he's coming to establish the kingdom of God on the earth under the direction of the Father. He will again come to earth as the authorized representative of God the Father. God the Father was symbolically on earth through Jesus during his earthly ministry. We'll read something on that a little later. Fulfilling his plan of salvation. In a similar way, Christ will once again represent God the Father when he returns to rule the earth. So that's why it can say in Revelation, as well as in Daniel chapter 9, well, you have reigned. And it says the kingdoms are the kingdoms of our Lord, God the Father, and his Christ. But the Father doesn't come to the earth until way at the end. But they're both a part of what's taking place. So in answering that uh, particular question, who will rule in the kingdom of God during the millennium? I guess you, could, you would say, well, technically both God the Father and Christ who will be on the earth, on the scene, well, Christ only at the time of the, time of the resurrection. So you could you clarify that a little bit, but you cannot dismiss the Father when the, when the millennium is established, God the Father doesn't go off somewhere and say, well, give me a call in 1,100 years when everything's finished and uh, I'll come on back. We still on his throne People during the millennium, the human beings are going to pray to God the Father. They're not going to say, our King of Kings in Jerusalem, hallowed be your name. They're praying to God the Father. That won't change. Christ is still going to be the high priest making intercession for the human beings on the earth during the millennium. So they both fulfill ruling the universe Jesus specifically taking care of matters here on the earth as a part of the kingdom of God. Okay, hopefully that's uh, clear. Not new, just a little uh, a distinction there on what those verses are saying. Okay, number six. Can you be in the kingdom of God but lose out on eternal life? Well, that makes you think a little bit too. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. And we want these questions to be a refresher, bring things back to our mind, a little bit challenging, make us think, because we should be experts. We're the experts on all matters pertaining to the kingdom of God. Who else would be? So, we, so these things need to be, of course, clear to us. Can you be in the kingdom of God but lose out on eternal life? Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our, our, our Lord. The gift of eternal life is from God. Sin leads to death. The gift of salvation is eternal life through Jesus, uh, through Jesus Christ our Lord. If you're given eternal life, you're in the kingdom of God, your spirit. You're now in the kingdom of God. God will not take that back. Once your spirit, you'll have eternal life. 
you will not lose that from all we understand. It's a gift from God. Remember Revelation chapter 20? Maybe we could look at that quickly. Revelation 20. This is the time of the resurrection and Christ's return. Revelation chapter 20. Here, uh, Satan, the, uh, Satan the devil is chained and, and laid hold on him, and he, he was bound for a thousand years. Verse 3, cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon it that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he would be loosed then for a little season. Verse 4, and I saw thrones, and they sat on them. Judgment was given unto them. Thrones, the saints. I saw the souls of those that were beheaded for the witness of Christ and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither had his image, neither had received his mark in their forehead or in their hands. They lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Well, those are the resurrected saints at the return of Christ. They're in the spiritual kingdom of God as spirit beings. Well, then it says, verse 5, and interjects this thought, the rest of the dead don't live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection, what we were talking about in verse 4. Blessed and holy is he that has part in that first resurrection. On such a second death has no power. No more death. We're all going to die once, but once resurrected and made spirit, the second death has no power. That tells you you're going to live forever. So the question, can you be in the kingdom of God but lose out on eternal life? No. The second death has no power. You have eternal life. If you're in the kingdom, you have to have eternal life. Flesh and blood cannot enter the kingdom of God. So we would make that deduction on that question, even though I don't, I guess there's no direct scripture on that. But resurrected to spirit being, then you have eternal life. The second death has no power. Can't die another time. Pointed unto men wants to die. Now, if you were thinking and asking the question when I said, well, can you be in the kingdom of God? And you're thinking of somebody living during the millennium, a physical person, then the answer would be yes. It kind of depends the context because we showed that kingdom of God can refer to actually two different things. The earth and people that are living during the earth or the spiritual kingdom of God. So if you thought about use the term kingdom of God and, and thought of the millennium and people living, well then, yes, they could lose out. But not the spiritual kingdom of God of spirit beings. Okay, hopefully that's, that's not confusing. Point number seven. Why does, Matthew, why does Matthew use kingdom of heaven instead of kingdom of God? Well, basically nobody really, really knows exactly. I don't know that it's clarified exactly uh, why, specifically. There's really no clear theological or biblical reason. There's nothing wrong with the term. We read back in Daniel chapter 2. It says, in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom. God's setting it up, and he's handing it over to Christ to administer it on his behalf and places all authority under him. It's already under him, actually. That's what Jesus told his disciples, all power has been given to me. I'm at, he's at God's right hand right now. In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. The kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces, consume all the kingdoms, it shall stand forever. So Matthew may have simply been using the word heaven as a euphemism to identify a kingdom that belonged to God, a heavenly kingdom. So we say, well, the kingdom of God, well, we know what that is. That's a kingdom God rules. That's why we can call the millennium the kingdom of God, because it's being ruled over by the spirit kingdom, the kingdom of God. But it's a heavenly kingdom. 
So it's the kingdom of heaven as well. It's not a kingdom coming from another part of the earth. It's a kingdom the result of heaven's power and authority. So there's really no other clear uh, special revelation as to what he meant and why he used that other than it's interchangeable. The problem that Matthew's statement has brought is when you say, well, the kingdom of heaven, it sounds like that's where you're going. You'll go up there and be in that kingdom up there. And that then becomes uh, confusing to some people, and that is not what it meant, that the reward is up in heaven. It's a heavenly kingdom, and it's perfectly clear that the kingdom is established on the earth. In the end, the Father comes to the new earth. So that's another issue about going to heaven and all of that, and that's been confused at times. But there's nothing wrong with the term that he used um, in, in calling it the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. They're interchangeable for, uh, for that reason. Okay, I think we're coming to question number eight. Uh, why don't I read this in Luke chapter 17? We have time for that. Luke 17 is a curious statement in verse 20. Then he went, and when he was demanded of the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God should come. That's why it's natural to call when Christ returns and the kingdom's established. Yeah, it's a kingdom of God too in that sense. When the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God comes not without observation, neither shall they say lo here or lo there. The kingdom of God is within you. And that's led to a number of different ideas about what the kingdom of God really is. It's, it's just a spiritual feeling, or sometimes it's thought of it as being the church, and it's all spiritualized away. Well, the people at that time did look to only a literal kingdom. When will you, your kingdom come and we get the Romans overthrown, we stay, uh, set up this kingdom of David once again, and they just thought of it in that context of ruling the other nations all on a physical level. Who had the upper hand? Who has the more power? Who has the, you know, the greater military? But of course, the kingdom of God involves so much more than that. And Jesus at times said, you know, forget about that part of it. Stop focusing only on, okay, Israel will rise up again and be the chief uh, nation on all the earth. Forget about that. There's spiritual dimension to all of this. The kingdom of God involves a spirit, a change of heart. The kingdom of God starts within you first. It's a change of heart. It's adhering to the principles of the kingdom of God. It's loving the way of the kingdom of God. It starts within you first. All they thought about is getting rid of the Romans and we're once again riding high on the earth as God's one, one name. When will you return set up your kingdom? Well, the kingdom of God's not just something you're going to watch be established physically only. There's a spiritual dimension to it. <laughs> the proof of that is that Christ was a representative of that kingdom, but they couldn't see it. Remember Matthew 12, Matthew 12, 28. He said, but if I cast out devils by the spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come unto you. The kingdom of God's come? Well, where? Where, where is it? I don't see it. Well, it's standing right in front of you. All of the principles, the values, the spirit of the kingdom of God is come unto you, here I am. So that's what he was trying to drive home or take it to the next level, you might say, the spiritual aspect of it. And of course, for all of us, we're said to be ambassadors for the kingdom of God. You see all of us, you see the kingdom of God. And that's a pretty heavy responsibility. We're to represent the kingdom of God and what God's all about. Now we do that in many ways. I think we often think of the Feast of Tabernacles. People remark about how, how well we do when we have the camps. 
The people that run those camps say, well, what a wonderful group. What, a, what an amazing group. We want your group back. Same way in the, in the conventions for the feast. There's a different spirit. Well, that's because we take that responsibility. We represent, we're ambassadors for the kingdom of God. Come in here, take a look at us, and here's the kingdom. Well, we hope we're on, our, <laughs> we're on our best foot here when they say that. Sometimes we're not always. But that's the sense, and of course, Jesus represented it without flaw. So the kingdom of God's not just some earthly control over other nations. It's much more than that, and it starts within us. This passage that we read there in Luke chapter 17 about being with entos, E-N-T-O-S, the Greek word that's translated within can also be translated in the midst of. That's Vine's Complete Expository Dictionary of the Old and New Testament Words, the New American Standard Bible, the New International Version, and Modern King James Version, and Green's Literal Translation translate this phrase, in your midst. Not within you. They say that more means in your midst. The kingdom of God's here. I'm here. You're touching the kingdom of God in spirit. So in this sense, Jesus, the king of the king, uh, coming kingdom of God, was standing in the midst of the Pharisees. These translations are clearly better for the kingdom of God was not in the hearts of those Pharisees. That isn't what he was, certainly wasn't trying to say that. Okay, that'll be the introduction here in the first split of the kingdom of God and the terms associated with it and what it means. I mentioned before, we're to be experts. What are you talking about the kingdom of God? Hopefully we're a little bit more that way was reading a book about the uh, book of Daniel. Recently, I found this statement, and it relates to chapter 7. Recall in Daniel 7, it's the four beasts that are four world ruling empires in history, and it talks about the saints ruling, etc. So here's what the book had to say. Now, see if you agree with everything that is stated. Now, maybe you do, maybe you don't. It says, several, several observations should be made concerning the saints ruling the world. First, this last part of the general interpretation was related to the last part of Daniel's dream, where the future kingdom of God was established on earth as the result of the Ancient of Days giving the rule of the earth to the Messiah. This means then that the saints will be given the rule of the earth when the future kingdom of God is established on the earth. Second, the saints will not bring in or establish the future kingdom of God. Instead, they will receive it. It is God who will establish the kingdom of God through his Messiah. Messiah will be the king and the saints will be sub-rulers under the king. And finally, third, it is the saints, not the unsaved, or we would say the unconverted. It is the saints, not the unsaved, who will receive the kingdom of God. Other passages indicate that only saved individuals will be allowed to enter the future kingdom of God when it's established. The unsaved who will be living at Christ's second coming will be executed. Yeah, that third part, we wouldn't agree with that, would we? That point number three, about everybody that's not, as they'd say, saved, we would say converted when Christ returns, they'll all be executed. At least that's the way it seems to read. So we wouldn't agree with that, but how would we show that's not the case? How would we show, how would we show someone that, no, 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 that's not the case. Everybody's not going to be executed that isn't uh, called a Christian when Christ returns to the earth. After all, he lists Matthew 13. He, go, he, he gets it right out of the Bible. So let me read that to you. Matthew 13. This was in the book as the proof of this. Matthew 13, 40 says, And therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it shall be at the end of this world, the end of the age. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, 
and them which do iniquity and shall cast them into a furnace of fire and there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Christ returns, he sends his angels, they gather all people that are the unsaved and throws them into, throws them into the fire where there's gnashing of teeth and that's the end of them. And the only thing left are what we would call uh, the saints or the, or the saved. Also mentions verse 47. Again, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good into the vessels, but cast the bad away. So shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the, from among the just and shall cast them into furnace of fire. There should be wailing and gnashing of teeth. That's the way it'll be. And then it'll be a, uh, a wonderful kingdom of all these uh, saints and converted people and everybody else eliminated. So you better get as many saved, I suppose would be one of the messages, as possible before it's too late. Well, how would you show that you, you don't think that's the way it's going to be? It's not going to be Christ returning and wiping out all unsaved or unconverted. What would you tell somebody? Those seem like pretty plain scriptures about the distinction, what the angels are going to do. Well, no, we do not believe that at Christ's return, all people living, whether uh, not in the church, everybody that's not in the church or converted know anything about Christianity. They're not going to be executed and annihilated and, and eliminated. Now, if somebody's actively fighting against Christ, well, then uh, that's bad news for them. Actively fighting Christ's return, they're going to lose their lives. But not everybody scattered all over the earth. It's going to take time for God's word to spread, for people to hear the message, for people to change. Many people will have been deceived they will have been clueless. They need an opportunity to repent, to, take, to see something. The vast majority of the world will be deceived or have never heard anything. They're not all going to get wiped out because they're unsaved. How about Isaiah chapter 2? Let's read that. Isaiah 2 and verse 4, as well as verse 3. It says in Isaiah 2 and verse 4, and he shall judge among the nations. Well, that's true. There's a judgment going on. He's going to be, he shall rebuke many people. That'll be true. They'll beat their swords into plowshares. They'll come around. They'll listen to the message. Their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not learn up, uh, lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. This is an education process. Many people will say, come and let us go up into the mountain of the, of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He'll teach us of his way. We'll walk in his path. We'll be instructed. We never knew this before. There's something good going on out, and coming out of Jerusalem. Let's go up there. Let's be instructed. After all, there's no Satan the devil anymore to have that, that negative broadcast, that animosity against God and his law. So people will be more receptive to going up and, and being taught. So spreading, uh, well, Zechariah chapter 14, I can read that to you. It's another verse. Zechariah 14, 17. Well, we know this, whosoever it would be that would not come up of all the families of the earth to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, even upon them will be no rain. So there'll be some reluctance. Not everybody's going to be converted after one day. There'll be some learning process. There'll be some punishment. They'll be given a time for people to respond. Everybody's not executed at Christ's return just because they were not Christians or, or in the church. Spreading God's word, teaching people, converting the world will be a job for the saints who are spirit beings. We live and reign under Christ. We'll have a responsibility of teaching of leading them. I imagine a group of people, if a spirit being showed up, well, they'd, be, they'd, they'd uh, take note. How'd you get to be a spirit? Imagine some of your friends, their jaw will probably hit the floor when you show up. <laughs> or me, <laughs> same with me. 
And well, how did that happen? And then apparently you can change from physical to spirit. I don't know what all we'll be doing, but the saints will be ruling. So we'll be guiding, bringing people along. The word will spread over months and maybe years into the millennium. Some will say, I'm not going up. Okay, no rain. Okay, we learned our lesson. So we have a different picture than what that seemed to project in that book. Christ's return, are you saved? Are you one of us? If not, they're all executed. That takes care of that problem. That's not really our understanding, the concept. The parable is stating a principle. Now, in principle, there is a separation. There are choices. Those choices will have to be made. In time, those in God's kingdom who reject it, yeah, they'll be, el- they'll be eliminated. Given enough time to ponder, to weigh it, if they reject it, yeah, they won't have a place in that kingdom. Not perpetually. So it's that principle more than ex- everything taking place, the exact day of Christ returns, you're either on his team or you're all executed and annihilated. That isn't the way it's going to be. But I mentioned the saints, and that's where I'd like to go with the remainder of time. What about the verses in Daniel that talk about us? Let's look at Daniel 7 then, verse 18. Daniel 7, 18. Here again in Daniel 7, 18, talks about the world ruling empires, the beasts, and then they come to an end. They don't go on perpetually As we know in Daniel chapter 2, a stone made without hands crushes the feet and becomes a kingdom. It's not another kingdom of men. You have Babylon, and then you had the Medo-Persian Empire, and the Greek Empire, and the Roman, and one comes out of the other. Now here's the final kingdom. It's not coming out of one of those physical nations. It's completely separate, establishing up a kingdom. But verse uh, 18 of Daniel chapter 7, And the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom that's coming and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. They're given the kingdom. Remember we read in, in Revelation 20, the saints lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. You ever find it difficult to think of yourself as qualified to rule? <laughs> You're going to be over all of these people. Some of them really... Uh, some of the powerful, the elite of society. Here you are, you're in charge, you're ruling, you're over a city or whatever it might be. Never find it difficult to think about yourself ruling. Why would I be given that responsibility? Ruling over the nations. That's what it says, though. The kingdom shall be given unto the saints, the people of the saints of God. That's very clear what's taking place. Of course, I never grew up with this. It was going to heaven. Just wanted to get to heaven. What are you going to do up there? Who knows? Who cares? I'm there. Now we're ruling. We're preparing to rule. Well, how are we doing that? Can we really picture that or think of that? Look at Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. We have God's spirit, but Not like we're all that powerful. As a matter of fact, it says of Philadelphia, you have little strength. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, in whom you also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit. Yeah, we received God's spirit at baptism. But it says here, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession and to the praise of his glory. So the spirit we've received like an earnest payment. Ever purchase a house, you put down earnest money. Ever think about, ever look at that, uh, how much you're going to be paying for the next 30 years and what that adds up to compared to the selling price? Well, that earnest money is not a whole lot compared to what you're going to end up paying after 30 years. Well, we're going to be receiving the rest of the Holy Spirit that will fulfill us. So we're going to be a lot, we're going to have a lot different mindset once we're changed and in God's kingdom as spirit beings. We're not going to have the limitations. We have some spirit now that does help us, but we'll have a great deal more 
and have all of the, all of the ability of a spirit being. So that's going to make a, long, a, a lot of difference of and by itself. So our spirit, mind, and body will be much different. We'll be able to walk in in front of a group of people and they're wondering what's going on and we'll be much more confident of, that we know what we're doing and what to say and what they need than maybe we can feel today. But we're to believe that's the case. We're to believe what the scriptures are telling us. Now we'll read 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5, which is the crux of the thought I'd like to leave us with this afternoon in this second portion. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 through 5. Here is how it works. Here's how we're going to be there. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again. There's been a now a spiritual birth in our experience. He's begotten or birthed us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead who made that spiritual birth possible to an inheritance which is incorruptible. The second death will have no power and undefiled, fades not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept, we're being kept, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. How are we doing this? How are we going to make it? How are we going to qualify, you might say? Well, we're kept by the power of God through faith. The Greek word which is used here for kept is only used in three locations. Let's read the other, the other two. 2 Corinthians 11. 2 Corinthians 11. It says in Damascus, the governor under Aretas, who was the king at the time, kept the city. And to keep that in mind. The Damascus, the governor under Aretas, the king, he kept the city of the Damascenes with a garrison desirous to apprehend me. And then also Galatians 3.23. Only three places the word kept is used, and we read about God keeping us. Keeping us how? In, in a jail? <laughs> House arrest? Galatians 3.23. But before faith came, they were kept under the law. Before faith came, we were under the law, limited. And once the penalty for breaking the law is sin, that's it. You're kept in the category of a sinner, can't get out until something happens. Before faith came through Christ, his sacrifice, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. So what this is meaning is, it, to, it means to keep as in a garrison or a fortress, or as within a military watch, somebody's watching over. The idea is that there's a faithful guardianship exercised, a guardianship watching, keeping, saving them from danger, like at the castle or the garrison. They were to watch and guard it against an approaching enemy. So it says we're kept. Thankfully, we are. So an authoritative power, it says there, what we read in Peter, an authoritative power has watch over us. God watches over us. And there's a pretty song about that. He watches over Israel, like somebody's watching. The scripture says God's watching over us. He's keeping us. He keeps us where we need to be, like watching over, you know, the garrison. The authoritative power has watch over us because we're vulnerable. We're weak in ourselves. 
We can go off on tangents. We can be led astray. We can fall short. We be can become fearful. We're surrounded by temptations. But somebody's watching over us. We're supposed to watch for each other, aren't we? We're to do that. We're supposed to care for our brethren. Many of you do this very well. Shepherds, the elders, along with the deacons and deaconesses as well, help watch over the congregation. But first and foremost, God, the Father, watches over. Because we're vulnerable, we can get into things, get ourselves into, into pickles or difficulties. We're tempted, surrounded in this world by dangers, my fears, but the scripture says God, we're kept. God watches and keeps us. But how does he do that? He keeps us with his power. It says it's not, it's not our strength. Look at Philippians 1, 6. God watches over us and keeps us. Now, he doesn't do it by putting our, you know, our arm behind our back. We have free will. But somehow he's watching and keeping us through faith. So it's not our strength. Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Christ. He's begun a work. He's called us into his church, into the spiritual body. Now he watches. He keeps us. He keeps us here. How? Well, it said through faith. 2 Timothy 1.12. Second Timothy 1.12 <clears throat> For which cause I also suffer these things, nevertheless I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, 2 Timothy 1.12, I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against the day. He can keep us. He can keep us in the kingdom or the spiritual body, spiritually translated into the kingdom. He is able to keep me. I want to be kept in the church. I want to be kept in the body. He says, I'll keep you. But God does not just step in and fight our battles. God doesn't necessarily chase everything away from us and walk in front of us and anything that comes away, he just shoes it off and brushes it off. And we kind of waltz through life because he's keeping us. That's not the way. He keeps us. It doesn't say he keeps us by his power. He keeps us through faith. The faith in us, not faith in him. He's got all the faith he needs. We're kept by faith in us. He excites and renews our faith. You ever feel like you've been down? Ever feel like you've been discouraged? Ever feel doubtful? Ever get angry and wonder why God allows something or this isn't right? Or you get discouraged with people. You get discouraged at the church and the leadership of the church and why have we done this and look at that. And you get kind of down and out about it. Sure, if you're human, in some ways that, that's bound to have affected all of us as me. But God then, if we look to him, he excites and renews our faith. He keeps us through faith that's working in our lives. Then we have the power. Our faith is restored. We kind of get, get back up and say, well, okay, I'm, I, okay, I've worked that out. I'm confident again. I know what I'm doing. Once again, I'm positive. Somebody renewed that. Now you're kept again. God's keeping you through faith that he renews in us. As long as we have faith, we're safe. God's not physically forcing us to come and sit here. Our faith drives us here. That's why we came. It's what's in us. Nobody forced us. God excited our faith. Well, I need to go to church. That's God's commandment. So as long as we have faith, Luke chapter 22, let's look at this. 
this kind of illustrates it quite well, I think. <clears throat> Luke chapter 22, verse 31. <clears throat> the Lord said, Simon, Simon, Satan, uh, behold, Satan has desired to have you that he would sift you like wheat. <laughs> Wouldn't be a whole lot left of you if God turned Satan loose, if Satan was free to do what he wanted. What did Jesus say? But I've prayed to God that he'd kick Satan out of here. I prayed that God would send Satan away. No, he said, but I have prayed for you that your faith fail not. I've prayed your faith is bolstered. If your faith is bolstered, you'll defeat Satan. You'll tell him to get out of here. You'll say, be gone, Satan, and he'll flee from you. So I've prayed for your faith. God keeps us by renewing our faith. Then we have the strength from God through faith. We continue walking and then we're kept where we're supposed to be. That's how, of course, we have our part, as we all know. And, of course, the, uh, the account of that is found in Hebrews chapter 11. Read a little bit of that. Hebrews chapter 11. Well, we know verse 32. What, what else am I going to say? Paul is writing for the time would fail me. I don't have enough, enough time and energy to even read about everything about Samson and Jephthah and David and so on, who through faith subdued kingdoms. Then say God overthrew the kingdoms and God over through faith. They had the strength they needed. Quench the violence of fire, escape the edge of the sword, not of weakness were made strong, etc., etc. The faith chapter, through faith, were kept, it says, through faith. So we keep marching forward. So God allows trials. He allows, he allows tests, and it shows us we can prevail through them when our faith is strong enough, when our courage is there that comes from God. God keeps us. We run up against a lot of stuff, and we have for many years, and God keeps us through faith. It's a spiritual issue and dimension. I see many of you doing that. I know you do as well. See, many of you doing that. It's very inspiring. Some of us have been through a lot of things, not only physical, but you know, all of us as a church, for that, you know, in that respect with what's gone on in the church in 20 years and some of these splits and all the rest of it, that's discouraging. Sometimes I'll comment to my wife when something happens that people hear or elsewhere, I think, boy, I don't know if I could do that. I don't know, or we'll talk to somebody and they're in a good attitude, and boy, I don't know if I could do that. Well, I could if I had to, if that's what I had to face. Well, then I would be kept through faith. That's a promise. I don't necessarily want, want to prove that in, a, in, every, in every way, but it, you would, whatever you're faced, you're kept. That's what the verse said, through faith. Jesus prayed, Peter, I'm praying that your faith is strengthened. Then you'll be fine. Then you'll be, then you'll be kept. Ephesians 2, 8. Ephesians 2, 8. This seems to make sense to us then, doesn't it? For by grace are you saved through faith. And it's not all by ourselves. It's a gift of God. God excites, renews, helps our faith. Like Jesus prayed for Peter. I've prayed that your faith would be strengthened. That's a prayer to God so that the gift of faith is given to Peter. That's how it works. 
So by, naturally, by grace are we saved through faith. We all have to have faith. Not always easy. And of course, it's not our faith. We'll somehow work it up. That's a gift of God. God has to determine when he gives it, what manner. We try to get ourselves lined up so he would choose to do that. Sometimes that, sometimes that takes a while. Well, our job is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians 4, 16. Second Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. Well, it's for this cause, because God keeps us, because we have the kingdom of God, in which the second death has no power, when we're spirit being, is salvation, and the kingdom of God, that's our goal. For that cause, we faint not. We haven't given up. But no, though our outward man is growing older, and weaker, more feeble, yet inwardly, that faith, that confidence, that's renewed. It's renewed by God. That's how he keeps us, watches over us, keeps us settled through faith. All we have to do is make sure we're in line for the faith to be able to give us and not resist it or quench it. That's our challenge. But for which faint we, we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man's renewed day by day. For our light affliction, and it's not always that light, which really in comparison to eternal life and life itself is really short-lived in most cases, but it'll work for us a far more exceeding eternal weight of glory when we maintain that faith and continue that walk. It brings a far more eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, and they're all around us, but we look at the things that are not seen, like Jesus tried to tell them about the kingdom of God. Here, it's among you. You're looking at the kingdom of God. Huh? Where? It's a spiritual, spiritual eyes. So we look at things that are not seen. The things which are seen are temporary. The things which are, which are uh, not seen, they're the eternal thing. We look at those through faith. And we're kept. Kept through whatever it is that might come. So sometimes I've said the hardest job about being a Christian is not living it today. Well, here we are all today. Hopefully, hopefully not that difficult to sit and listen, listen to this today. Not difficult to be, maybe be a Christian today. It's wanting to be one tomorrow. Well, that, that's another decision, another step. I've got to be that tomorrow. I've got to do something. That's a way of looking at it. Hardest thing's not being a Christian today, but desiring to live it tomorrow. That's not automatic. Something has to be restored for us to be kept. God won't do it on his own. God will pre preserve us and fulfill his promises that we will rule as long as we seek his spirit to renew our faith. So when we're resurrected and we're teaching people, we're going to be explaining you know, many things similar to what I've just explained now we understand it clearly. And we're given the, the rest of the spirit. We'll be qualified. We'll know what we're talking about. We lived it. Even sometimes we can't articulate it. You know exactly what's going on. Be able to explain it to people. We're being qualified. Now let me re read something that might be an illustration worth, worth pondering here. This is something that took place in a classroom, a, a, an instructor, his name was Ken Davis. And he says, in college, I was asked to prepare a lesson to teach my speech class. 
We were to be graded on our creativity and ability to drive home a point in a memorable way. <clears throat> I guess he was in the class, not teaching it. The title of my talk was The Law of the Pendulum. Now, do all of you know what the law of the pendulum is? Mm, probably. I spent 20 minutes carefully teaching the physical principle that governs a swinging pendulum. We know what a pendulum is. Fixed, fixed at the top and swings back and forth. The law of the pendulum is a pendulum can never return to a point higher than the point from which it was released. You hold it way over here, let it go, it'll never come back and make it to where you let it go. Can't do it. Because of friction and gravity, when the pendulum returns, it will fall short of its original release point. Each time it swings, it makes less and less of an arc until finally it is at rest. We've seen that. This point of rest is called the state of equilibrium, where all forces acting on the pendulum are equal. I attached a three-foot string to a child's toy top and secured it to the top of the blackboard with a thumbtack. I pulled the top to one side and made a mark on the blackboard where I let it go. Each time it swung back, I made a new mark, and it took less than a minute for the top to complete its swinging and come to rest. When I finished demonstration, the markings on the blackboard proved my thesis, the law of the pendulum. Then I asked how many people in the room believed the law of the pendulum was true. All of my classmates raised their hands. So did the teacher. He started to walk to the front of the room thinking the class was over. In reality, I was just getting going. Hanging from the steel ceiling beams in the middle of the room was a large, crude, but functional pendulum. 250 pounds of metal weight tied to four strands of 500 pound test parachute cord. Now we're talking a huge pendulum, 50 pounds of weight at the end. Well, I invited the instructor to climb up on a table and sit in a chair with the back of his head against a cement wall. Here, touch your head against the wall. Then I brought the 250 pounds of metal up to his nose. Holding the huge pendulum just a fraction of an inch from his face, I once again explained the law of the pendulum. He had applauded only moments before. If the law of the pendulum is true, then when I release this mass of metal, it will swing across the room and return short of the release point. Your nose will no longer be in danger. After that final restatement of this law, I looked at him, uh, looked him in the eye and asked, Sir, do you believe this law is, is true? Well, there was a long pause. <laughs> Huge beads of sweat formed on his upper lip, and then he weakly nodded and whispered, Yes. I released the pendulum. It made a swishing sound as it arced across the room. At the far end of its swing, it paused momentarily and started heading back. I never saw a man move so fast in my life. He literally dived from the table, deftly stepping around the still swinging pendulum. I asked the class, does he believe in the law of the pendulum? The students unanimously answered, no. Interesting uh, experiment there. And I wonder how many of us, that huge thing swinging way out, and here it comes. It's supposed to stop just short of my nose, but what if for some reason it, it doesn't? Who would have the faith to know the law of the pendulum? Here's the professor. Moments ago, oh, yes, oh, I believe that law. Oh, of course I believe the law. But when it came to the test, facing it, 
Mm, they asked the class, does he, have, does he have faith in the law? No, he didn't. Well, God renews our faith so we can face not some pendulum swinging, but this world and Satan. We can look at head on and know we can defeat that. It's not greater than we are. There's a law, a spiritual law, that God keeps us. Jesus said that no one will be you know, taken from God's hand. He will keep us. But our natural tendency is going to be get up and get out of here. It's too dangerous, too frightful, too uncertain. But we have to stand in the face of the world, and the world coming at us all the time. We're facing the world. But through faith, that is how we defeat it. It's not us. If we were the ones, we'd be out of there just like the professor. Get me out of here. That's what Hebrews chapter 11 all, all, is all about. That's why Abraham is called the father of the faithful. We'll read one more scripture. Galatians chapter 3. Abraham is called the father of the faithful. We're saved by grace through faith. We're kept by faith. That we have to renew, allow God to renew it. Not our strength, and it's not God going to do it. If God renews our faith, grants us that gift, and then we're able to stand up and face what the world has to, has to say. Jesus said, don't worry, I've overcome the world. You will overcome it. You'll be kept through faith. So that's why it says in Galatians chapter 3, verse 26, for you are all children of God through faith. Doesn't matter whether we're Israelites. You're children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek. It's not about that. It's about spirit faith. There's neither bond or free, neither male nor female, for they're all of one in Christ Jesus. If you're a Christian, then you're Abraham's seed spiritually. The faith Abraham had to sacrifice Isaac. Then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise, and you will be ruling in the kingdom of God because God will keep us through faith.